All right, well, good evening. Welcome to Advocates, or should I say welcome back to Advocates. Uh, we took several weeks off uh, for the Christmas holidays and everything, and so I hope you guys had a good Christmas and, and, a, and a good start to this new year. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, for those of you who are sitting here for the first time, Advocates is a class on Christian apologetics. Christian apologetics is sort of the art and the science of rationally defending your faith. It's a multidisciplinary field where you can use history and philosophy and science and theology and kind of bring it all together to show that Christianity is something rational and something that you can think about and defend. Um, so just to kind of uh, walk you through the, the format of how this works, um, usually we kind of start with a small video. We, we're not doing that tonight. Um, and I should remind you that these sessions are being recorded we have a video recording and an audio recording as well, and the audio session will be available online at least maybe like in the next two days, okay? Um, so just to kind of show you how it works, we'll, uh, I'm just going to start teaching, and we'll stop. I'll stop teaching at about 7.45ish, and I'll give you guys about 15 or 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end if you have any questions, okay? And... Uh, if I could ask the guys, some of the guys, to stay back after class to just help, help put the chairs away, that would be great. I would appreciate it. Okay, so January is Sanctity of Life Month. Um, I actually think January 22nd, I believe, is Sanctity of Life Day. I think it's, that's, that's the day um, we, we officially think of it uh, and, and commemorate the day, but... Um, the whole month of January, people are generally, pro-life Christians especially, are just being aware and being thoughtful about the whole issue of the sanctity of life and making the case against abortion. Now, because this is such a massive issue, we're actually going to cover this in two separate sessions. All right, We're having a session tonight uh, in which we'll be covering some of the, 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 the you know, superficial things like the, the statistics, the demographics, the, the overall landscape of abortion uh, in the United States and a little bit around the world as well. Uh, but next week, we're going to actually go deeper into each of the pro-choice arguments that are made in favor of abortion. And I'm going to give you tools and resources and try to equip you with how we can give a we can give a reason, we can give a defense against the pro-choice arguments that are made, all right? So next week is actually when we get into the, a lot of the meat and potatoes of this issue, um, and so definitely make sure to be here next week. I guarantee you the, the information we go through will be very, very um, valuable to you, all right? Uh, so why are we talking about this issue? Um, a lot of people have said, Prashant, do we really need to talk about this? It's a very hot social topic. It's kind of a, it's, it's an emotional topic. It's a topic that can get people riled up. Uh, some people have even said it's a topic that actually brings division in the church uh, and can cause a lot of hurt to some people. So why are we talking about this? Um, let me first actually speak to the causing, to the causing hurt part. Um, and I, I want to make sure I address that very, very, very clearly. There may be some here for whom this issue hits pretty close to home. Or you may know loved ones, you may know people who are close to you, people who are very dear to you, for whom this is a reality. Uh, and one thing I want to say right off the bat is a lot of these people have faced uh, some extreme hurts and pains because of uh, incidents like this. But I think it's also, we should be forthcoming enough to say that a lot of people have also experienced a lot of hurt from the church. Uh, and I, I'm not necessarily saying Cornerstone Church, but churches around the world. There are a lot of churches that have actually come down very hard on women who have had abortions, and uh, to the extent of even almost treating it like an unpardonable sin. And I can guarantee you, it is not an unpardonable sin. Amen. Okay? So, there is nothing, there is no sin that the, the, that the cross does not have the power to clean. Right. All right? Jesus died for it, for it, for it. 
It is cleansed. It is Isaiah chapter 1 says, For though your sins are as red as scarlet, they will be made as white as snow. Okay? And Jesus wants us to be his spotless bride. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that Jesus is able to wipe your sins clean? Okay? So if there is anybody in here who has bought into that lie, or if there is anybody in here who knows someone else who has been told that if you've had an abortion, you have no way back to the cross. Uh, if you've had an abortion, you can never be forgiven for that. You are an outcast. If they've been treated like an outcast, that is the greatest lie that they have believed. And I want you to, if you can, talk to them, affirm them that there is forgiveness at the cross. Yeah. Abortion is not beyond the power of Jesus to yeah. forgive. Okay? So, I want to make sure we say that right up, up, up front and clearly uh, so everybody gets that. As far as this issue being divisive or controversial, um, instead of answering that with a verbal response, I actually want to show you a video. It's a very short video. Um, it's only about a minute long. I do want to warn you, it is extremely graphic. Um, so if there's people in here who don't want to see it, you're welcome to look away. That's fine. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation for that. If you feel like you need to step out of the room for a little bit, that's okay. Uh, the video is actually going to show not the actual procedure of abortion, but the consequences, the aftermath of the abortion. All right? Uh, it's only, it's just under a minute. There will be some music playing. If you don't want to see it, then as soon as the music starts, just look down, and when the music stops, you can look back up again. Uh, and I'll explain to you kind of the, the rationale behind why uh, it's important to actually visually see this, okay? Is why we need to talk about it. Because this is happening every day. Last year alone, 2018 just went by. Last year alone, the total number of abortions around the world was 42 million plus. Over 42 million abortions just last year. This is the modern Holocaust. And it is happening every day. Uh, you know, someone might say, Prashant, you're, why do we need to see this? I understand. You can just tell us about it. You can just explain it. Why do we have to watch this graphic stuff? This just seems like emotional manipulation. Actually, I have been told that in the past. And um, my response to the, the, the charge of emotional manipulation is, what's wrong with that? I think sometimes we do need to be evoked or provoked emotionally um, to, to kind of cause our, our moral intuitions to rise to the surface. A lot of times we just we listen to things, we don't actually, we don't actually go into it and, and face the reality of the situation, and I think we don't understand the magnitude of the issue. And that actually causes <coughs> us to harden our hearts, not be tender to the, to the severity 
of the issue. Okay, and so uh, let me kind of share a story with you to illustrate this point. Uh, in 1955, Emmett Till, an African American boy, uh, was 14 years of age, traveled from his hometown in Chicago uh, to visit his cousin in a small town called Money in Mississippi. Uh, after his arrival one day, his uh, cousins were kind of ribbing him about uh, his, his white girlfriends back in Chicago, and they dared him to go talk to a white woman who worked at the local grocery store uh, in, the, in the small town of Money. Uh, so that afternoon, they went into the local grocery store, and, and Emmett walked in, and he bought a piece of gum, and, uh, you know, he, he kind of flirtatiously smiled at, at the white woman behind the counter, and he said, uh, thanks, babe, or something to that effect, and he walked out. Now, we wouldn't think anything of it, right? Okay, he's 14 years old, he kind of flirted with the girl behind the counter, walked out. No big deal, right? Not if you're black in 1955, small town Mississippi. Three days later, that boy was taken at gunpoint from his uncle's home by that woman's husband and another man. They drove him outside of town after savagely beating him for several hours, breaking every bone in his torso and face. Uh, they finished him off with a gunshot to the head. Uh, they tied something heavy on his neck and threw his body in the river. Uh, when the sheriff discovered the body uh, at the bottom of the river three or four days later, he was just shocked by what he saw. And uh, he put whatever was left of Emmett in a wooden box and decided to ship it uh, to his mother in Chicago. Now, the local <coughs> law enforcement talked to his mother, and she, uh, they asked her, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to have a funeral, and I want it to be an open casket funeral. Um, and uh, the sheriff said, ma'am, I don't think that's a good idea. He's barely recognizable. He's terribly disfigured. It's a grisly image. I don't think that needs to be done. She said, no, I want the world to see what they did to my little boy. And so they did an open casket funeral. And the following week, uh, pictures of Emmett Till's uh, corpse was actually uh, published on Jet Magazine all, all across the nation, and it sparked a national outrage that actually jump-started the civil rights movement. That was the power of an image, okay? That's kind of similarly the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, after the Allied forces won the war, and then the Nuremberg trial was kind of on its way. Nobody really knew the magnitude of what was going on, except the fact that the Germans were uh, ill-treating Jews in Auschwitz and Poland and Dachau and all these places. But video actually came in. And in the courts, they actually played the video of dozers dozing piles and piles of human bodies and rooms, entire rooms filled with tons and tons of human hair and just incredible sights, and it completely shook the world at its core, to the point where we got the Geneva Conventions, we got the United Nations Security Council, all these things fell into place because we never wanted something like that to be repeated again, just like in the story of Emmett Till. So why do we show these pictures? Because if we pro-life Christians don't take the lid off of the casket of abortion, the culture will never confront a horror that it never has to look at. Does that make sense? So, a lot of times when these kind of images are shown, a lot of people get upset, and understandably so. But instead of, instead of taking that to be as, I don't want to get upset looking about this, it should actually move us to action. It should move us to prayers at best. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the reason for why I started off with a graphic video, even though it was probably disturbing to watch. But let's, let's get into the issue, and we'll actually go through some of these things and kind of, kind of look through the magnitude of on what scale this is actually happening right here in the United States and across the world. So for a lot of people, I think 1973 actually kind of settled this, right? In 1973, the famous Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion 
uh, the Supreme Court legalized it. And for a lot of people that was settled, they said, look, it's a constitutional thing now, it's legal. Why are we still talking about this? And so the question that needs to be asked is, is abortion a constitutional right? The, uh, the Supreme Court seemed to think so. Okay, now, a small interesting piece of information. Before 1973, abortion was already illegal in 30 states. Okay, in 16 of those states, it was legal in case of rape, incest, or damaged fetus. And in four states, it was completely legal upon request. So what did the 1973 decision actually do? The decision actually basically decriminalized abortion in all 50 states. That's pretty much what it did. Okay? <laughs> and I want to show you <clears throat> how they came to that decision. The Supreme Court deemed that abortion was essentially a privacy issue, thereby criminalizing a woman's decision to abort her baby was a violation of her constitutional right to privacy. That's how the Supreme Court argued this case. They said that it was a privacy issue. And if the government or the state was to step in and say, no, you are not allowed to have an abortion, the Supreme Court said that that was a violation of her constitutional right to privacy. Now, here's a question. Do we have a constitutional right to privacy? Well, it turns out we actually do. We actually do. It's called the 14th Amendment. Um, in the Bill of Rights, actually refers to our right to, I'm sorry, the Fourth Amendment. The Bill of Rights actually refers to our right to privacy, or otherwise called the right to be left alone. Let me actually show you the amendment right there. So, did I say Fourth Amendment? I meant the 14th Amendment. Okay? The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now here's the question. Where exactly in this amendment do you see a very clear interpretation of a woman's constitutional right to abortion? Is it obvious? It's not. The Supreme Court's interpretation of that was a huge stretch for them to come to that conclusion. Okay? The court deemed that the woman's personal autonomy from government intrusion into her decision to have an abortion Required constitutional protection. Well, what's the problem with this interpretation? Well, besides the, the obvious problem, I think it's a consistency problem as well. See, here's the thing. You, your constitutional rights are protected insofar as they don't violate somebody else's constitutional rights. Okay? Let me say that again. Your constitutional rights can only be protected insofar as they are not, a, not violating someone else's constitutional rights. So for example, if John was my neighbor, right, and he just feels like singing, he comes out 10 o'clock at night, stands in his backyard, and decides to sing. Does he have the freedom of expression and the constitutional right to do that? Of course he does. But if he sings so loudly that it disturbs my right to have a quiet evening, now he's violating my constitutional right. And the, 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 the courts will deem that as a public nuisance. Do you see that? I know, it's a, I'm using kind of an extreme analogy here to make the point. But the fact of the matter is, your rights, your constitutional rights are protected only insofar as they don't violate somebody else's rights. It's the same thing like if you go to a movie theater, you have the right to go watch a movie. You have the right to watch the movie back to back as long as you pay for it. You have the right to buy as many concessions or whatever you want. You do not have the right to stand up in the middle of the court and shout, fire. <laughs> you will be punished for that. And if you are taken to court, you cannot tell the judge, it's my freedom of speech, so I have to, I exercise my freedom of speech to stand up in the middle of a crowded public place and mm -hmm. shout, fire. He'd say, no can do, son. Your constitutional rights there are limited. So what's the point? The point is... Nobody's constitutional rights are absolute. 
There's always checks and balances and limitations. Your rights are not absolute and only constitutionally protected as long as they don't violate someone else's constitutional rights. Now, here's the issue. What is the parallel with the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision? The courts deemed that the woman's constitutional right to have an abortion should be protected, but was the right of the child to live considered? It wasn't. So they deemed in favor of the woman, but it was at the same time violating the right of the child to live. Right? Where was that considered? That wasn't considered. It was deemed absolute. <coughs> the Supreme Court ruled that the woman's right to privacy is absolute. And no consideration needs to be given to the unborn growing inside of her. Does that make sense? Are you guys tracking with me? I would say that the right to live supersedes the right to not be pregnant. Fair enough? The right to live supersedes the right to not be pregnant. <laughs> Let's keep going. Some, uh, I want to show you some statistics. Um, most of these statistics I'm going to show you is from the Guttmacher Institute and the Center for Disease Control. The Guttmacher Institute is a more reliable resource, I think, because they actually, uh, they actually uh, check in with the states and they get direct data directly from the states. Uh, the only problem is they don't do it consistently, so sometimes you'll get a lot of robust data from like 2011, and the next set of robust data will be 2014, and so forth. So it's not consistent, but it's reliable, okay? Uh, the Center for Disease Control is okay, it's, it's, not, it's not as accurate, uh, but in your handouts, I've given you uh, an amalgamation of both sets of statistics, um, so you can take a look for yourself, okay? So let's keep going. So abortion through the years. 1996, abortion was at 1.36 million. 2000, it dropped down to 1.31 million. 2002, uh, 1.29 million. 2005, 1.2 million. All the way down to 2014, where it was at 926,240,000. ,000. So, what does this look like? It looks like abortion has been dropping in the United States. That's good news. That is good news. It's been dropping. So, the question is, why has it been dropping? <clears throat> now, actually, if you go and look at, look at the statistics, in 1973, when the Supreme Court legalized um, abortion, there was a spike in abortions over the next 10 years. Okay? Abortion spiked. It went up really high, and I'm going to give you a statistic later to show that. But after that, after, after about 1985, 1986, it kind of started to taper down, and it's been dropping since then. So as bad as the abortion numbers actually are, the trend is actually on a downward um, slope, which is good. It's good. So what's the cause for that? Why is that happening? Well, I would say that one of the primary reasons is the advancement of ultrasound technology. Now, ultrasound was originally invented in 1956, uh, but you know how things are when something is first invented. It's a prototype. It doesn't really go into mass production the commercial market. So it usually takes, you know, sometimes a couple of decades before it actually becomes pretty commercial. And so that's actually what happened with ultrasound is uh, it was available here and there in the 70s. It really picked up steam in the 80s. And in the 90s, it was everywhere. So I think this is one of the reasons why um, abortion has actually been steadily on the drop because it has been able to give us more detailed information on fetal development uh, real-time images of the baby, and even Doppler technology that helps us hear the baby's heartbeat. <clears throat> and according to some resources, according to some statistics, anywhere from 85 to upward of 90% of women who go in to have abortions change their minds after they see an ultrasound. Over 90% of women who go in to have abortions, change their minds after they see an ultrasound. That's remarkable. That's remarkable data. What does this information tell us? 
it actually shows us the identity of the unborn, right? When you go back in, in, in time, before this kind of technology was available, the woman was not really able to see what's happening. She would lie down, and for the most part, everything is covered. She doesn't see what is extracted out of her, and they refer to it as tissue or pregnancy, you know, whatever, and they just pull it out. And she never has to see it. But while it is still inside of her, she's now able to see this living, growing, breathing, kicking life inside of her, and it changes her mind to have an abortion. Okay? This goes back to the human tendency to respond to something more emphatically when we actually see it with our own eyes. It's easier to be apathetic when you don't have to face the reality of something, but when you actually look at it, it feels more real. And um, over 90% of women change their minds on abortion. Now, what does this mean? This ultrasound technology is bad news for the abortion business. So I don't know if some of you know about this, but just in the last five years, I actually read a case that uh, Planned Parenthood, it's, it's actually not been made very public, but Planned Parenthood is actually pushing uh, for Congress to pass a bill that will actually limit the use of ultrasounds around uh, hospitals and pregnancy clinics or abortion clinics, and in some cases to actually remove ultrasounds altogether from these clinics. Why is that the case? So there are currently at least 13 states, okay, states that require ultrasound before an abortion are these states, Arizona, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, <clears throat> Louisiana, Mississippi, <clears throat> Alabama, Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, and Wisconsin. These require that a woman be provided access to an ultrasound before she has an abortion. And these are precisely the markets that Planned Parenthood wants to target uh, because it's bad for business. But there is a hypocrisy to this scenario. Is this obvious to some people yet? Are you, are you able to see the hypocrisy behind this? What is the hypocrisy? Why are pro-choice organizations against the choice of women having access to ultrasound technology? You see that? If you're all about choice, if you're all about giving women the choice to make an informed decision, if you're going to rail against the patriarchy for making women pregnant and not giving us a choice and all these things, well, ultrasound technology gives them a choice. It just so happens that women are making choices that are against your favor. The data says that 9 out of 10 women change their minds about abortion after they see an ultrasound. That's their choice. Why take that choice away from them? Because it is bad for business. This is demented. For a movement that literally touts itself as a pro-choice movement, it seems that removing ultrasound machines is actually removing the choice for women to make their own decisions. So clearly, there is an agenda here, right? The termination of babies is good business. Women's choice is just a veneer to cover up their true agenda. When it supports their agenda, they're all for it. When it conflicts with their agenda, they want to remove it. Now, I would, going back to the, the actual reasons why abortion has been dropping, another second reason is uh, the work of pro-life organizations. <clears throat> As uh, technology has improved, uh, so has the, the strength and the capabilities and the voices of a lot of pro-life organizations that have banded together and really united with the church in many, in many senses to fight against this thing. They've done good work in identifying the nature of the unborn child. They've done excellent work in offering resources, services, and support for crisis pregnancies. And they have done a fairly decent job exposing the evils of the abortion industry. Now, some of you will remember, uh, I think when was this last year or the year before that, there was a group called CMP, the Center for Medical Progress. And uh, they actually did some sting videos <coughs> of interviews with high-level, high-ranking directors of Planned Parenthood. You guys are familiar with what I'm talking about? Uh, so, and now CMP got pummeled for it, right? They got into a lot of trouble. Planned Parenthood used all of its, its, uh, its legal strength and money and resources to literally pummel uh, the CMP down. 
I, I actually tend, tend to think that even though CMP, what they were doing was really good, I don't think they were very strategic in how they went about doing it. It was kind of like a lone wolf kind of approach to dealing with Planned Parenthood, and I think they seriously underestimated the legal power and the influence that Planned Parenthood had. And that's why now CMP has kind of disappeared into oblivion. Nobody knows what's going on with them. But the fact of the matter is, pro-life organizations have done excellent work in actually combating this issue, and people are becoming more and more aware of the process uh, and the evils of abortion. Now, uh, according to the United Nations report in 2013, only nine countries in the world have a higher abortion rate than the United States. There are Bulgaria, Cuba, Estonia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Romania, Russia, Sweden, and Ukraine. Now, the annual number of legal induced, legally induced abortions in the United States doubled between 1973 and 1979, and it peaked in 1990. There was a slow but steady decline through the 90s. Okay, so I'm going to keep showing you more uh, data about abortion. In 2016, unmarried women accounted for 86% of all abortions. 59% of abortions were by women who already have children. I think that's, 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 that second stat line is probably what's disturbing to me. I mean, it's one thing if, you know, it's one thing if you've never had uh, an abortion before, it's, you never had children before, and it's the first time, but 59% uh, were by women who have already had children. I'm gonna show you reasons why uh, abortions happen as well. Uh, next piece of data. At current rates, one out of four American women will have an abortion before the age of 45. So those are staggering rates. Okay. Before 1973, 16.3 women per thousand, that is between the age bracket of 15 to 45, uh, were having abortions. After 1973, there was a spike. This was the spike I was talking to you, uh, talking to you about. Went from 16.3 to 29.3 women per thousand for the same age group. Nearly 49% of abortions were by people below the poverty line. For you know, let me just kind of digress from my notes here a little bit. Um, the whole do, do you all know what the eugenics movement is about? Eugenics was this whole idea of culling the population based on ethnic superiority or inferiority, okay? And sort of the visionary for Planned Parenthood was a woman named Margaret Sanger, a long time ago. Margaret Sanger was an open eugenicist. She openly believed that the, the white races were superior and some of the, the darker folk and the Hispanics and all of that were not. And so even though she didn't, if you read some of her material, there's, there's a lot of veiled references to those kind of things, but she never actually came out and openly said it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is she really did think that, listen, um, we need to call the population of these people. So let's, let's make these services, let's push these services, and Planned Parenthood's uh, major target audience are uh, the, the poor, uh, people below the poverty line, and especially targeting African Americans and Hispanics. In the U.S., almost 50% of pregnancies are unintended, out of which 25% end in abortions. These are staggering numbers. Okay, when do women have abortions? Now, this big, this big slice over here is uh, prior to eight weeks. So that's about 66%. Two thirds of abortions occur at about eight weeks of pregnancy or earlier. And then, if you add the nine to ten weeks and add the 11 to 12 weeks, uh, that accounts uh, for a much higher percentage. Almost 90% of abortions occur in the first trimester. 90%. I don't know how many of you all the way back there are able to see it. I apologize for uh, the small TV. That's not my fault. Okay, we need, we need TV. But, um, but yeah, the, the, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the percentage of abortions that happen in the first 12 weeks. What are the reasons for abortion? 
And you should have some of these on your handouts as well. 25% uh, of abortions are because the woman's just not ready for a child. 23% is because they cannot afford a baby. Uh, there's, the, there's a financial aspect to that. 19% are because they're just done having children. I think that's, that's a disturbing line right there. 19% because they just don't want to have any more children. 7% uh, is because they feel they're not mature enough to raise a child. Again, you can, you can kind of, that's a, the interesting thing about statistics is you can read between the lines, right? You can see what's going on. So that tells you that a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of young, young women are getting pregnant. Okay, really young women. Let's keep going. More reasons. 8% uh, don't want to be a single mother. 4% they don't want it to interfere with their education or career. 4%... Um, have abortions because they have their own physical health problems that they think they cannot sustain this pregnancy all the way to the end. About 3% is because of fetal health problems, actual uh, problems with the growing, developing baby inside. Now you can also, you know that in a lot of cases uh, today, there are lots of pregnancy clinics, there are abortion clinics, there are <coughs> hospitals that actually do ultrasounds and they will actually tell you that, look, it seems like your baby has a problem. It seems like your baby has Down syndrome. It seems like your baby has some sort of developmental issue that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your life. This is going to change your life completely. This child will require constant care, constant medical intervention. This child is going to require your complete undivided attention. If you want to do that, that's fine. But if you don't, there's abortion. Okay? 3% of abortions are for those particular reasons. And this, is, this may actually be a surprising statistic. As far as rape, rape only accounts for about less than 0.5% of abortions. If you listen to the pro-choice movement making the argument, they will, they will highlight rape as if it is one of the primary problems, one of the primary reasons for what justifies abortion. And now we're going to get into this, okay? I'm, I, I don't want to get into the actual, uh, the moral uh, reasons for whether rape justifies abortion or not. We're going to get into that stuff next week. We're actually going to go through what are the morally permissible reasons. There's actually only one morally permissible reason that is, is unavoidable, but it results in the abortion of the child. Uh, but every other reason... Uh, there is no justification for the killing of the child. We are going to unpack all of those uh, really deep issues next week, so definitely don't miss next week. Uh, today we're just kind of doing a survey of the statistics of the reasons for rape. Okay, So rape actually only accounts for less than 0.5% of abortions. Nearly 3,000 abortions take place somewhere in the United States every day. An abortion takes place every 1.5 seconds somewhere in the world. Every 1.5 seconds. That means, by the time we are done with this class, over 5,000 babies would have been terminated around the world. That's just in an hour and a half. This is the modern Holocaust. And Christians need to be aware of what is going on, okay? So how is this done? Let's talk about abortion procedures, uh, <coughs> abortifacient pills. I, actually, before we kind of get into that, I, I think it's important for us to talk about some terminology, some definitions. Uh, birth control, the term birth control actually includes any device or practice mm -hmm. that prevents birth, and that includes elective abortion. Uh, contraception, unfortunately, is a term that's been very loosely used. But contraception actually means uh, the, the, the prevention of you getting pregnant, right? It prevents the uh, ovulation, which is the production of the egg, or it pre it, as a backup mechanism, it can also prevent the egg and the sperm from actually coming together. All right? So when you talk about contraceptive pills, there's actually two categories. One kind is the kind that actually prevents conception from happening. That is okay. That is morally okay. Because until the, the, the egg and the sperm 
come together to unite. You don't have a human being yet. Okay, so that is morally permissible. But the problem is the word contraception, because it's so widely used, it includes abortifacient pills as well. And abortifacient pills are pills that actually kill the, the, the zygote or the embryo that's already conceived. Okay, and we have next week I'm going to share with you uh, scientific uh, evidence for why we have a human being at conception. Not much later, not after it's revealed on the ultrasound, but at the point of conception, we already have a human being. Okay? And abortifacient pills actually uh, kill human beings. There are specific medicines that are designed to kill the zygote either directly or by rendering the walls of the uterus inhospitable for the attachment of the zygote. Here's an important part, you probably want to write this down. Contraception prevents conception, but abortion kills the conceived. Okay, does that make sense? Contraception prevents conception, but abortion kills that which is already conceived. You don't have a human being in one part, but you already do in the next part. The second type of abortion procedure, something called vacuum aspiration, otherwise called a suction abortion. Uh, this is usually done within the first 12 weeks. Um, once the, here, here's a picture of the actual uh, tool. I apologize for the picture being a little blurry. It's probably one of the best uh, pictures I could get for free without having to pay for royalty for the photographer or whatever. Um, but, so essentially the way this works is the woman is sedated and she's comfortable and a tool called a speculum is inserted to keep her vagina open for maximum access. An anesthetic is administered and a vacuum head is then inserted into the cervix and the procedure is completed in a few minutes. After the procedure, the doctor will make sure to see if everything is accounted for and if the woman is doing okay, then she will be allowed to go home. What do we mean when we say, is everything accounted for? Basically, body parts. Okay, that's what we mean. So once that is used, everything is sucked out, pushed out onto a, onto a tray or something like that, and the doctor will examine it to see if all the body parts are accounted for, is that if everything is accounted for, they make sure to see if the woman is doing okay. If she's doing okay, she can go. This procedure is called vacuum aspiration. This is the most common abortion procedure. It's called DNA dilation and evacuation. This is usually done in the second trimester when you're more than 13 weeks along. This procedure requires a little bit more prep. So the doctors will give you uh, treatments or medication to soften the woman's uterus and to prepare her cervix for the procedure. Again, a speculum will be used to keep the vagina open, except this time, along with the vacuum, there will be another tool that looks like forceps. I actually have uh, pictures of some of these tools here. Uh, a tool called a curette is also used to scrape the walls of the uterus to make sure all the remainder parts are removed and nothing is left behind. Now, in some cases, a shot is administered into the womb to stop the fetal heartbeat before the procedure begins. So if, if you can see right here, that's the, that's the shot that they administer. That is actually, that it wasn't always done like that. That's more of a recent phenomenon. I think sometime in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years or so is when they've started doing that. Pro-choicers will often point at that and say that, see, that's a more humane way to do it. Uh, so we're good. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. And what they'll often say is they'll, they'll draw a parallel to capital punishment. Right? They'll draw a parallel to capital punishment and say, see, we have, we've figured out a humane way to kill criminals. Basically, you strap them on the bed and you have these machines that pump uh, this, uh, this set of chemicals into the, into the criminal. And as far as he's concerned, he's falling asleep. He just doesn't wake up. Does. And he doesn't even feel like he's dying. He just feels like he's falling asleep. And so what they say is, see, that's that's what we're doing. We administer a shot into the womb. Uh, the baby just the baby's heart just stops, and then we we use all of these uh, horrible tools, and then we pull everything off. <coughs> Here's a problem with that analogy. 
you're talking about a criminal and you're comparing a criminal to an innocent child. The reason that criminal is going through capital punishment is because he actually did something wrong and he deserved that punishment. What did the child deserve? There's no parallel. The second thing is, how do we know that it's not hurting the child? They actually don't have a way to prove that. They administer the shot, they watch the, they watch the Doppler, and, and the heartbeat just kind of slows down and it stops. And you say, see, the baby went away peacefully. We don't know that. We don't know if the baby went away peacefully. That child could have screamed his heart out and nobody heard it. He could have been in extreme pain and he died. How can we morally justify saying, would we, say, would we use this argument against a toddler? To say, look, at least let's put the toddler to sleep before we rip her limb from limb. Does that work? No. In fact, that is one of the tactics I'm going to show you next week to rebut all these pro-choice arguments. Because it's all going to hang on the identity of the unborn that is inside of the, of the woman's uh, uterus. There is nothing humane about that. Okay? For those of us who are parents, we know how hard it is when our children are sick. We know how hard it is when they're in pain. It bothers us. It hurts us. But at least they have a voice to tell us. Which one of these children have a voice to tell us? <laughs> these are silent screams that nobody hears. Nobody hears that. We have to be their voice. We have to fight for them. We have to fight for their justice. We have to be their advocates. What does this mean from a Christian perspective? The Bible, well, actually, let, let me ask you this. What does the Bible say about abortion? Actually, the Bible says nothing about abortion. But the Bible does say it is wrong to kill innocent people. There is no doubt about that. The Bible forbids killing innocent persons. And if the unborn is an innocent person, it follows logically that the Bible condemns abortion. Does that make sense? In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word yeled is used to refer to the unborn and children as old as teenagers. In the New Testament, the Greek word brephos is used to refer to the unborn, sorry, I spelled that wrong there, the unborn, newborns, and youth. <coughs> what does this tell us? It tells us that God himself does not make a distinction. When he talks about human beings in the womb and human beings outside of the womb, they are both equally considered part of the human family, right? Scripture is clear about that. God himself makes no distinction between the unborn, newborns, and youth, but considers all of them equal members of the human family. So, here's the point. Whether it is inside or outside the womb, the biblical position is that they are persons regardless of the developmental stage that they are in. There's a lot of debates about this. When does the baby actually consider human? When is the baby actually a life? When is, at what stage in the development is abortion okay, and at what stage is it not okay? These are all deep philosophical questions that need to be answered, and these are precisely the kind of issues we are going to be tackling next week. Okay. If that's the case, if this is if this is true, if it is true that these are persons, regardless of the developmental stage they're in, then all of these scripture verses are going to apply. I'm going to read some scripture verses for you. If you want to write it down, that's fine. I don't have slides for those verses, but I'm just going to read it. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. For the image of God he made man. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, this is pretty straightforward. You shall not murder. What is murder? Murder is the unjust and indiscriminate taking of an innocent person's life. Deuteronomy 27, 25. Cursed is he who accepts a bribe to strike down an innocent person. In Proverbs chapter 6, 16 to 19, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven even which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Let me show you another, another amazing verse, a beautiful verse, that talks about the glory of, of what God did. Okay, Psalms 139, 13 to 16. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully put together in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Is God talking to human beings? Yes, he is. He's talking to human beings about human beings. He's talking to human beings about unborn human beings even. These are human beings. The world, the culture will try to argue otherwise. And we are going to examine next week why they are wrong. Okay? So if this is true, this is the ultimate question it comes down to. How then as Christians do we engage the culture against abortion? Oh wait, let's show them all those Bible verses. Does that work? No. Why doesn't it work? Is it, that it, it won't work not because scripture doesn't have power. Scripture does have the power to transform people's hearts. But the fact of the matter is, because you consider the Word of God authoritative doesn't mean that the culture also does. You see that? So this is why, as Christians, we have to engage more tactfully about the issue of abortion. It's not sufficient to simply throw a Bible verse at the culture. We have to try to adopt other methods, and that, that's some of the things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how to use philosophy. We're going to talk about how to use science to, to combat these false ideas. The entire abortion debate does not hang on the question of freedom. It does not hang on the question of women's rights. It does not hang on the question of a mother's choice. It hangs on one issue and one issue only, and that is this, what is the unborn? Let me give you an example. If you're standing at home and uh, you're doing the dishes and your child comes up, your, your little son comes up behind you and says, mommy, can I kill this? What is your first question going to be? Kill what? You want to know what it is, right? If it's a spider, go for it. <laughs> Neighbor's cat, something's wrong with you. <laughs> Your little sister, you need counseling. <laughs> right? The question of what it is needs to be answered before you can decide whether you can kill it. Does that make sense? What is the unborn? All the arguments that the pro-choice movement makes about women cannot, should not be forced to endure the financial burden. They should not be forced to, to, to have a child if they're not ready for it. She has the freedom to do with her body whatever she wants. She has to, all those, are, I will accept all of those arguments. I will accept the entire abortion argument by the pro-choice movement if, if the unborn is not human. Does that make sense? But if the unborn is a person, 
If the unborn is a full member of the human race, if the unborn is a human being, then abortion is the indiscriminate and unjust murder of an innocent human being. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of abortion, like I said, does not hang around women's choice. It is not about women's freedom. It is about what is the unborn. This is a point that is going to be the linchpin of the case that you make against the pro-choice movement. Okay, and we're going to show you next week how to do that, how to systematically dismantle all the arguments that the pro-choice movement makes, and uh, we're going to talk about how to use science and philosophy to help you do that. Uh, next week, I will also I will, I will walk you through uh, every objection, every objection that is usually raised in favor of abortion, and we'll, we'll talk about how to demolish every argument uh, that is in favor of abortion as well. Let me just finish on this one note. I want to go back to the point that I actually began with. There may be people in this room for whom this issue hits close to home. You may personally know somebody who has gone through this. And I think sometimes pro-lifers even people who care about the, the sanctity of life, people who care about abortion, I, I mean, people who, who care about, uh, you know, the value of the human child, I think sometimes we, we mischaracterize people who have abortions. I think we think sometimes, we have this kind of cartoonish view in our head that a woman who, who has had an abortion woke up that morning and was like, ha, I can't wait to murder that child in my stomach today. No. No, that's not what she's thinking. A lot of times, a lot of times, women who end up having abortions end up doing it because they feel like they're trapped. They feel like they don't have a choice. They feel like there's no other option for them. And I, and I grant you, a lot of times, sometimes they believe lies. There are definitely women out there who think that it doesn't matter. Because it's, it's like clipping my fingernails. There's also, fingernails are also part of your tissue. They're made of your human body. They're tissue. You clip them, it's no big deal. No harm, no foul. But we cannot compare that being inside of you to your fingernail or to your hair. Because that is an entirely different entity. Okay? And so, these are things that we need to consider. We have to, as the church, it is important for us to come around women who are in crisis pregnancies. It is important for us to offer our support and resources and the best of the resources that we can have to prevent them from going down this path. The solution is not to demonize women who have had abortions. The solution is, number one, to come around them and support women who are in crisis pregnancies so that they don't make this choice. And for the women who have made the choice uh, to have an abortion, show them the cross. We have to show them that abortion is not an unpardonable sin. Amen? We have to show them that the power of the cross is way more powerful and is able to wipe away all of that. If you have had an abortion in the past, and if you've committed this to the Lord, and you've confessed it and asked for forgiveness, I promise you it is not held against you anymore. It is not on your record anymore. Isaiah chapter 1, For though your sins are as red as scarlet, they will be made as white as snow. Jesus will keep his promise to make you his spotless bride. And if this is something you have committed to the Lord, it is over. It is done. It is finished. It was finished on the cross. Do not believe the lie that if you have had an abortion, you are an outcast. You do not belong in the church. God will not forgive you. You are anathema. You should not come anywhere near people who believe in life. Don't believe any of those lies. Okay? The cross has the power to forgive. Jesus has already taken care of that. That is the message that I want you to take home. Look, this is real stuff. This could be somebody's mother. This could be somebody's sister. God forbid, this could be somebody's daughter. If your daughter came home and said, Dad, I'm pregnant, what do you
are you going to do? Let me talk to the men here for a second. Oh, by the way, this is not a women's issue. This is a human issue. I was actually going to give you this example next week, but I'll tell you now. I was talking to somebody some time ago, and this person uh, told me, uh, uh, Prashant, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, why? She said, because you are a man. You are incapable of becoming pregnant. <laughs> Therefore, you do not understand a woman's plight. And because you do not understand, you forfeit the right to have an opinion on this issue. Who wants to tell me what's the problem with that argument? <laughs> Go ahead, shout it out. What's the problem with that argument? It's a powerful argument, by the way. Because it, it pits one gender against the other, right? <coughs> in this particular culture that we live in, this culture of toxic masculinity, this culture of uh, this militant feminist movement, this culture of the Me Too movement and all that, whoa, men back off as soon as they hear this. <laughs> We're like, oh my goodness, we, uh, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. You don't have to experience something to have an opinion about it. Mm. Okay, say a little bit more. Unpack that a little bit more for me. I don't have to know exactly what somebody's going through to know that it's wrong. Okay. Okay. You're, you're red hot. I just want you to go over the edge. Go ahead, Roger. The, uh, the fetus is not hers alone. Okay. It's made by two people. Okay. Okay. Right? By that logic, very though, every single person everywhere has a different experience, so no one would ever be able to comment on meaningless experience, even if somebody was exactly the same racial profile as me and everything. We both had different upbringings, so technically you couldn't have any opinion on anything I do, because my experiences are slightly different in some way. Right, and all of you, all of you are that close. Let me tell you exactly judges what it is. Make, judges make rules based on people's murder, and they have never committed murder. Here's the issue. What does your gender have to do with the fact that killing an innocent human being is wrong? Nothing. Your gender has nothing to do with it. Whether you're male or female, if you notice that killing an innocent person is an objective moral sin, you have the right to state that. Your gender doesn't give you any special privileges. Okay? This is like saying that uh, when it comes to the Holocaust, that non-Jewish people should not have an opinion about the Holocaust. <laughs> this is like saying, oh, you are, you're, you're not Jewish, so therefore you cannot say that what is happening in the concentration camps at Dachau is wrong. What does that have to do with anything? What, that's not an ethnic issue, it's a human issue. This is not a women's issue. This is a men, this is a human issue. Okay, so I, I don't want I don't want to give the impression that this entire talk on abortion is only for the women. No, it is for the guys as well. For the husbands, the fathers, the brothers, all of us. Like I said, tomorrow, if your daughter came up and said, Dad, I'm pregnant, what are you gonna say? Are you going to be tempted to protect your honor and just tell her to go and discreetly get it aborted? What are we going to do? See, when you make it personal, it becomes a more complex issue. This is why it's important for us to think about this. This is not a women's issue. This is a human issue. Okay? So let me just end over there. Uh, we have a little bit of time. I'll kind of open up the floor if you guys have any uh, questions. Uh, I know you have a lot of questions, and I actually think the majority of the questions you guys probably have. We're going to actually cover those issues next week, so definitely come next week, but the floor is open if any of you have any questions from today's session. If we don't, uh, I can go ahead and pray, and we'll dismiss the class, and I'm, I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer if any of you want to come and talk to me. That's fine too, okay? So let's go ahead and pray. So Father, we just come before you tonight, Lord. So Lord, as heavy as our hearts are to, to even think about issues like this, God, we know that we, it's not like we care about these issues more than you do. You are the creator of life. You 
have created all of these innocent babies in your image. And Lord, we have sacrificed a lot at the altar of personal comfort and convenience. And Father, we repent for that, God. And for, for those of us in this room tonight, we pray that you will bring down any blinders, you will bring down any, any hearts that have been hardened in this issue, but also, most importantly, Lord, I just pray that you will bring healing to anybody here who is hurting from this. That you, will, that you will bring healing to someone here who even maybe knows somebody else who has gone through something like this. And to show them emphatically that the cross has the power to forgive. That Jesus, you died on the cross. And if this sin has been committed and consecrated before you, that it no longer hangs above the head of that woman. Father, we pray that we as the church... Will, bring, will be gracious and compassionate and will come around women who are struggling in these issues instead of standing off to the side and demonizing them or wagging our finger at them, God. We pray that we will not be judgmental like that. We pray that we will not be self-righteous, but instead that we will speak the truth in love and that we will offer the best of our abilities and the best of our resources to come around women in issues like this, Father. We pray, Lord, that even tonight as we part ways, that you will continue to just resonate these issues in our heart and that we may think deeply and that all of us as Christians, because we believe in a God who is the creator of the cosmos and who's made people in his own image, by default, if you are a Christian, you are pro-life. And we have to be pro-life, God. And we pray, Lord, that you will help to just emphasize that point in our hearts, God. But most importantly, Lord, I pray for next week that we have... Uh, everybody come back next week where we actually go through the issues of what is it that makes you human? What is it that makes this small child, this little child inside of us, a human being and why they deserve every right to live and every dignity as everybody else has as a human being? We thank you, Father. We thank you for this opportunity to talk about this issue. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will uh, resonate your truth in our hearts and minds and that uh, we will be open and keep our, our, our conscience as tender uh, to an issue like this, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, and we ask you all this in your wonderful and precious name. Amen.